Hi, Laurie. Hello. Hi, Laurie. Hi. Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I made it. I may. I'm so happy. I'm not in a uh, in a car driving. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we were gutted when we saw that message. It was like, no. I was like, Whoa. I made it home in time. So I'm very happy. Excellent. Nice to see you. Lovely to Excellent. see you. That's a lovely. It's a lovely backdrop you've got that there. That is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. What's going on there then? They're tigers from India. It's one of those room dividers, you know, that normally. But I just put it on the wall because I thought it was so. Cool. Beautiful. Excellent. Very Thank good. you. Excellent. And where are you? Where are you right now? What's your location? We're central London. So Great. England. Yes. Okay. Nice. And where are you, Laurie? What part of the world? I am in Malibu. Okay. Oh. So is that is that central time? It's uh no, it's Pacific time. So it's oh, uh 10, 10 a.m. my time, yeah. Yeah, excellent no nice. we're grateful we're so grateful for your time thank you no problem at all it's exciting excellent great film by the way princess of the row oh isn't it beautiful oh yeah. it's stunning um i don't want to oh. go into it too much just now but, yeah. <laughs> no, but i do i have a real connection to the story oh. so, um no really really beautiful and well done thank you for bringing that to the screen that was oh, no problem. no problem um hi eddie Hello, hello. Eddie's here, hello. Morgan's here. Morgan, hi there. An honor, a pleasure. Thank you. You can hear us. Good. Hey, Morgan. Hey. Hi, Morgan. How are we? We're well. Hey, hello, Lori. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Excellent. I'm fantastic. Nice to see everybody. Indeed. Hello, Morgan. How are you doing? Oh, I'm fantastic. I'm in New York at the moment. Okay. Are you working? My favorite, what are you my doing? favorite city. It's my favorite city, so I just I always love being here. Now I'm taking a a little writer's retreat. I'm working on some material, so oh, I'm out nice. here just hanging out. Yeah. Good. All right. All right. So those voices that you can hear are Eddie Kathegi, Morgan Freeman, Laurie McCreary is also joining us on the Screen Lately show. Good evening from London and good morning, good afternoon, whatever the case may be. It's sort of noon here. Noon for you, Morgan. What time is it for you, Eddie? It's, it's one o'clock. One o'clock. And what time is it for you, Laurie? It is 10 a.m. I'm the early bird. Excellent. Excellent. Well, lovely to have you all with us on the Screen Lately show. So let's kick it off then. Um, let's start off with a nice icebreaker of a question. What was the last film that you guys saw at the cinema, given that we're in a post-pandemic era and the cinemas were not available to us? Can, can you recall the last time you were at the cinema and what you saw? Laurie shaking her head. Go for it. Yeah, I she can. can remember. I, um, I, it was a special screening on the Warner Brothers lot of Dune, Denis Villeneuve directed. Um, we're just in the process of finalizing a big science fiction project for him to direct and I wanted to see it before anyone else. So it was, and the Warner Brothers <clears throat> theater is fantastic, huge, huge screen with amazing sound. And I just sat there transfixed. It was, and I had been, you know, locked down for a year and a half almost by the time I saw it. So it was kind of a, a amazing assault on my senses, but so beautiful. And you didn't bring Morgan along with you? He, no, he I wasn't little, there. He lives a little far away. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, no problem. I'm usually I'm usually very late to pop culture trends. So believe it or not, I watched Harry Potter for the first time during the pandemic. That's one of the things that we went through the entire series. So now uh, I, I got to see each new one when it comes out. So Dumbledore is what I saw a couple of weeks ago. Aww. The Secrets of Dumbledore, nice. and it was uh, it was it was it was good fun. Excellent. I think Morgan, you said you, you couldn't remember whether the last time you were at the cinema. What was the last film that you saw in general? Do, do you get to watch a lot of films? Well, I'm trying to think <laughs> because uh, my memory is pretty much shot these days. Um, you know, I'm aging into senility. I might as well admit that. So I can't remember 
I don't remember the last time I saw a movie in the cinema. Oh, awesome. I, I, I remember. I remember I one that you. Since, yeah, I've been like Lori. I've been in lockdown for ever. You know, I sneak away and do a little bit of a film every now and then, but that's it. I haven't been socializing or going out to anything. That's cool. Sorry, I Lori. Think, I was no. going to say, I think I know. I think you you screened your Zach Braff film, A Good Person. I think you told me that you saw that. Did you Did you see that? No. I mean, I I, I was sent the the uh, I was sent the uh, what do you call it? Link. Yeah, the connection. So. And I still don't remember seeing it. It's very good. It's coming good. out this year. It's very good. It's called a good person. Good Lovely. to hear. We look out for it. Thank Excellent. you so much. Now, in many ways, um, the company which you founded, both you, Morgan and Laurie, Revelations Entertainment, has been ahead of the game from a streaming perspective, having become the very first film production company in history to distribute a film online while the movie was still playing in theaters. Now talk to us about how the opportunity arose to get into the streaming business before Netflix. Hmm. Are you asking me or are you asking Lori? Because uh, she knows. Shall we go ladies first? Uh, I'll start and Morgan, you can add color. How's that? Okay. We, um, we had been working with Intel, the chip company for many years. Um, uh, helping them in their business and helping them get into the entertainment business. And it was with the um, digital effects computers. They were wanting their computers to help build the big digital effects, but they were a little lacking in the software and the hardware. Anyway, I have a computer science degree. So at the company, one of the ways, you know, in the film business, you have to make money to develop projects so that you can put them on the screen. So one of the ways in the beginning of our company, we raised money was by doing technology. So we worked with Intel on this technology. And when the time came in the early 2000s, when we started realizing that our business might go the way of the music business, where everyone was just um, pirating music, um, Intel came to us and said, what do you think is going to happen in the future um, you know, with movies? How do we protect movies? And so we started working with them, um, talking about how we can protect movies in the future. And one way is to make them available. So if they're available and you can pay a little bit of money to see them, then maybe people wouldn't be pirating them. So we teamed up with Intel to start a company called Clickstar. Clickstar. And, um, and I think, Morgan, you can take it from there. Clickstar. Yeah. Uh, so the idea that we had, Lori, I should say, had, because she uses computer scientists and I'm an idiot. Uh, yeah, we could, uh, as the technology was presenting itself, we could make movies available uh, through that medium, just like Netflix is doing. Uh, but this was, wow, how many years ago? 2005. Problem was that our technology was not developed, I guess, but, uh, far enough or fast enough uh, to really meet that demand. Because when we went online, the whole thing crashed. There were so many hits out of at it, boom, just like that. So obviously there was a there was a, a desire for that to happen. It just we were ahead of our time. We were ahead of our time. You've heard of the um, people are on the cutting edge. We were on the bleeding edge. <laughs> so we were probably three years too soon, um, where the technology was not as fast as it is now and the so we couldn't keep up with the demand and but there also weren't enough people to support the business so we kept going for a while with intel support and then we said okay and then of course four years later boom it all happened mm. but we feel like we pioneered the way you certainly did and talk to us about the film that you actually distributed 10 years or less tell us the story behind why that film was kind of going to be the launch pad for this. Which film? 10 years Ten or items. less. 10 items or less. 10 items or less. Oh. Uh, I can't. Lori? That, no. was, a, that was a, a film with Paz Vega, 
that uh, Brad Silberling directed. And we did, we, we actually shot that film in 15 and a half days, which if you know, I mean, Eddie will tell us how long it took Princess of the Row, but it's a, a very small amount of time for a big movie that's gonna go out wide. And, um, and it was fully financed by the tech, the tech world. And we thought at the time we kept, I, I love technology, but I was also afraid at the time that the technology business would take over the entertainment business. And lo and behold, we are kind of there. <laughs> Indeed. Now, believe it or not, my wife Claire made a film in seven and a half days, her first feature film in the UK. She can tell you what about it. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah, That's rough. Thank you so much. I won't take off your time because I want to hear from you. But yeah, that was my debut. And I think you do. It's a baptism of fire, isn't it? You know, it's an independent movie. We financed it ourselves. And oh. um, yeah, it's called No Shade. It's a romantic drama about colorism. But I want Ooh, to talk to Wait, you. I want to see that. How do we see I, it? I will send you a link. I think you'll love okay. it. I really do. Because it speaks to women. It's about just, you know, us always being feeling like we're not enough la 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 um but no it's, it's doing good things i want to hear from eddie um because princess of the row really really spoke to me uh personally i grew up in foster care so i cried several times watching the movie um because caring for a parent with mental health issues is a lived experience for me and eddie i thought your performance was exceptional and I really wanted to know as a actor, what, where, how, what did you kind of draw from to portray um, that father figure that you played? Well, I think everything begins with um, just your, your passion for the material, your passion for the subject matter. Mm -hmm. And I've always been somebody who had a big heart for the disenfranchised and uh, the, the, the the people with our homes and the people who have been pushed to the margins of society. I've always been passionate about that. So I was looking for a story to tell in this particular space. And it just came to me, just like all great things through God. And uh, I, I knew I knew I had to play this part. And that just required me doing all the homework. You know, yeah. as, as an actor, you just have to do your homework, study, uh, everything that there is to study about it, read all the books on mental health that you can get your hands on, spend time on Skid Row. We actually shot our film on Skid Row. Yes. Uh, which was an experience. Wow. And we had a, we had a uh, Skid Row liaison, who a former veteran who was homeless, mm -hmm. and he would take us around Skid Row and introduce us to his friends and to his community so we could get the seal of approval so we could actually shoot there without having any problems. Uh, so I spent, I spent a lot of time on Skid Row. And my, my wife actually said, um, you cannot sleep on Skid Row because you have a graduate acting degree, so act. I will, <laughs> That's uh, right. That's doors. right. <laughs> I, yes. I will lock the doors on you if you try to spend the night on Skid Row. I was she like, bring you a blank. knows that? <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah. it's true. There's like that thin line, isn't there, about wanting to do that method acting of really immersing yourself, but also understanding that it's a role. You know, you're not here to literally like yeah. immerse yourself right. in that world. Yeah, you're portraying a character. <laughs> and that's and a acting, fascinating conversation that's happening. Right. Go ahead, Morgan. Acting is believing, it ain't being. That's it. That part. <laughs> yeah. it's so true. Definitely. And talk to us about um I, I will, how, oh go on. So AD go. No, on. I was just, I mean, that's a conversation that's that's a conversation that's happening right now. This whole method acting and a lot of actors are getting flack for for method acting. For me, I, I I used to look down on method acting and there's a part of me that still does. But what I learned in this particular role mm -hmm. is sometimes you cannot play the part unless you give more of yourself to it. Um, and, and the role requires from you what it requires from you. So I had to live as this character for far more than I felt comfortable living in any character's skin, um, which kind of veers towards the method. Uh, I didn't live on Skid Row, so I guess I didn't go full method, which I guess is what we're talking about, acting is a tactic. But I did, it was very hard for me to shake off this character nightly. I basically, and we only shot for 19 days going back to Lloyd's. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
19 days, which is really quick shoot. So I was pretty much in character for 19 days and then I was out. And talk to us about the relationship we have as a They're producer delayed. of this film, not just as an actor, but obviously you're one of the producers and Laurie and Morgan are executive producers. Um, how much counsel did Morgan give you as an actor? Was there any of that uh, consultation from... <laughs> He's shaking his head. Right. Yeah. Uh, he taught me everything he knew. <laughs> 100%. Well, no, obviously, you know, Morgan, my godfather um, in, in, in this space and hugely, you know, sought after. So was there anything that you gleaned from Morgan or did you have any conversations about you know, how you were going to play the role or, the, you know, anything, just anything that we can share with our listeners as they're thinking about watching this on Bohemia Euphoria. And we got the timing all wrong here because uh, I actually had nothing to do with the picture or uh, him creating the role. I wasn't there. I mean, I'm a, I'm a visitor. Uh, I, I just, I saw the film and I was just completely knocked out by it. Mm. Uh, everything connected to it, uh, it, it is right about the, the locale, the authenticity of the people in the background, his own authenticity. I just couldn't believe it. It was just a wonderful portrait, Uh and such a sort of one-off story. Mm. I'd never seen anything quite like it before. Me too. Me too. Four cents. Hundred mm, mm -hmm, percent. And I, I want to add. I want to add something to that. Um, while, while he wasn't there as we made this film, I mean, it, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that this is Sir Morgan Freeman. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, this is a man whose work I have studied and admired for my whole entire career. So there is a part of my performance that is influenced by uh, the great that came before me. These effects. I'll, I'll take that. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And what, what are the kind of messages for audiences to take away from this film? I know it was released in the States last year, and obviously Claire alluded to Bohemian Euphoria, who acquired the UK rights to the film earlier this year. Um, and that film, along with No Shade, which we talked about earlier, can also be seen on Bohemian Euphoria. So what have audiences got to look forward to when they stream Princess of the Road tonight or whenever they get a chance to watch such a potent film and potent storyline? Well, if you're asking me, I'll, I'll I just think go first. That, and okay. Yeah. If you're asking me, I think they, uh, what you come away with was what I just uh, uh, sort of tried to uh, describe. It's a one off experience. Uh, the acting isn't acting, actually. You don't see actors on stage. You see people who are in a situation, uh, totally believable, totally believable, uh, and uh, memorable, I'm gonna put it that way. Very, very memorable story and picture. That's what you'll come away with. And if I can ask you, Morgan, how has acting evolved um, over the last 10, 15, 20 years? Have you seen a considerable difference in performances and just no. kind of how? No, I think from the beginning, acting has always been acting. Uh, you learn your lines and you learn your position on the stage or on the set and you hit your marks. That's, that's the, it's always been the way, no matter what. Uh, Filmmaking and such is the only thing that has actually evolved, not acting. And if I can bring you in here, Laurie, how was producing involved to, to that extent, following on from what Morgan said there? Wow, well, producing, uh, I've been doing it on a much shorter time than Morgan's been acting, but for the last 20 some years, it's it's really changed um, in terms of what we do on, on set. and. It, you know, obviously we went from at more analog film based to digital, so we can move a lot faster. We can, um, and, but what hasn't happened, which I would love to see happen is we can be more efficient, but oftentimes we're not more efficient on set. And um, I would love to see our business 
care about the teams and the crews more and and be more like Clint Eastwood does on his sets where he shoots 10 hour days and then people go home and are with their families. I think we've all been on projects, my own and otherwise, where you're working 14 hour days and you don't really have a time to have a personal life. Mm -hmm. But I think where we learn about life and everything that we want to put out on the big screen to show people is when we're not working. And so I would love to have more of a balance on sets where we're filming 10 hours and then going home and having real lives and having real full weekends. So um, while technology has helped us, there's also room for us to grow in our business. And obviously producing is very different now because we have fewer outlets. There might be more content being made because there's lots of television and limited series and series and films, but the the big theatrical releases aren't there and there are fewer places to sell because everyone's kind of being a big conglomerate. Mm -hmm. So it's a little harder um, when you only have seven or eight places to sell to. True. And also, Laurie, just to follow on from that, because there's a statistic about there being 2% women in the whole business. And, you know, I know we're always champion and we see certain names come up but you know, you're a female producer, so you're still, you know, a unicorn. <laughs> what do you think we can do to bring more women into spaces like producing, you know, and, and directing? I think I, I, it's a really good point. I think that we need to be mindful when we're bringing on new, new people on our teams from the, the PAs to trainees that we start looking for underrepresented groups and females are still underrepresented in our business woefully underrepresented, especially in like grip and electric and, and um, sound. yeah, and sound. And there's just so many. Um, we had a show called Madam Secretary and we were fortunate enough to be a show that a lot of people wanted to be on. And so we went to the Teamsters and said, I, we want more people of color and more women on the Teamster team. So we kind of sucked in the people from New York who were, who were there and we had a, a more representative team. But when you're, as you know, you did a film in seven and a half days, when you're a producer and you're trying to put your project together, it's an added stress to also try to make sure your, your team is diversified. And, and, and so you just have to commit to doing it. And you have to hire people and make sure your heads of departments are committed to doing it. And, and I would just say mentor, mentor, mentor. I, mm -hmm. I, I try to talk to people that are just coming up um, it used to be that, you know, a producer would hire their friend's kids. So sure. if you're an underrepresented person in it, that's a great way to do it. But if you're someone who looks more like me, I need to go outside of just my family group to bring in people of color. So I think we all need to kind of stretch a little bit. Lovely. Eddie, if, if I can bring you in here, because um, as Laurie was talking, I was reminded of the achievements of James Samuel, who directed The Harder They Fall. And he won a BAFTA this year for his directorial debut. What was it like to work with James on his first big project? I mean, I've known James for over 10 years. I met him in London when I was doing X-Men. And he told me about this movie that he'd been working on for quite some time. And cut to uh, 10 years later, I'm, I'm in the movie. But we workshopped that film. We shot little scenes for it before it got set up at a studio. Uh, it's it's a testament to perseverance. This is a man who had an idea and he didn't let the industry tell him that it couldn't be, couldn't be done. And in fact, I think he might've broke some records for his debut because Netflix gave him a healthy budget and an amazing cast for his debut. So this is all just perseverance. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, I don't know whether you guys have been to Cannes. Morgan, I'm sure in all your time you've been to the Cannes Film Festival, have you? Yes, yes, yeah. um, two or three times. And can you recall what the experiences were like? Did you go there with films or did you go there for pleasure business? All right, we, we went there with um, our first, was it our first film or not? The, well, what, the first film. Uh, one of the first films, which was um, um, one with uh, Gene Hackman, Laurie. Under Suspicion. Oh, Under I love that film. Love that film. Yeah. Love right. That, uh, that was a remake of a French film, and Morgan introduced it 
in the French language, which oh, wow. blew, every, blew everyone away because he was, I don't know how to say perfect in French, but he was that. <laughs> Très bien. Très bien. Eh, formidable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oui. <laughs> Excellent. And Laurie, I'm sure you've been to Cannes as well. Any, any anecdotes? Well, I think um, I'd been to Cannes maybe four, four or five times before um, under suspicion. The very first time I went, I was a new producer. Morgan and I had just started the company and I didn't know, I knew hardly anyone. I was so nervous, but then I saw a little Intel sign down on the cassette. And that's when I first got connected with, believe it or not, a technology company. So I have fond memories of Cannes and Morgan and I, over the years have been there quite a few times. We brought Clickstar over there to introduce streaming to the Cannes Film Festival um, and uh, have great memories. It's a great time for, especially as producers, we don't often get to come together outside of you know, seeing each other maybe during award season. So it's a good time to see colleagues and friends because we're all individually on our sets, all in different parts of the world. So it's a great time to come together. Yeah. It's a great place to uh, meet filmmakers from around the world. That's what really happens there and at the Berlin Film Festival. Excellent. And Eddie, have you, have you been to Cannes yet? No, I've never been to Cannes, but I, what, I love, what I love about that film festival in particular is I think some of the greatest things that happen come from revolutions. And, and Cannes was one of those festivals that started because uh, Hitler and Benito Mussolini uh, were trying to angle the Venice Film Festival in a specific way and French filmmakers felt left out. So they went, well, we're gonna create a uh, competitive film <laughs> festival. And they just, they created it out of a necessity uh, to, to, to answer back against fascism. And what? I think that that's a cool beginning. I'm yeah. responding like you, Laurie, because I'm, I'm quite a film geek. Um, I, this is the first I'm hearing about the kind of how Cannes all came together. So that, that's fascinating. Eddie, that's a great limited series for us to do. Together. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm in New York working on something that I'm going to bring to you. <laughs> OK, good, good, good. I was going to ask you, so what have you guys got planned apart from this project, which we've all kind of signed ourselves up to, I guess? <laughs> well, I'm, ex I'm excited about this project, first of all. Yeah. Um, and I have to, I can't, I can't, we can't do this whole interview without me uh, continuing to thank <laughs> Morgan and Laurie. Because uh, without Lori's perseverance and, and fight to get our movie out there in the world, it wouldn't have the life that it has. And we're on HBO Max in the States and, you know, people have seen our film and, and, and the work that, and, the, and the messaging that we're putting out there to the world. And uh, it's because of Lori and it's because of Morgan. And, and I thank them from the bottom of my heart for jumping on board with us. You're more than a little bit welcome. We were happy to do it. We, we often see films um, in a later stage, right? The, that we're not developing them, we're not producing them, but we see them. And this, this was one of the first that we saw and Morgan and I both looked at each other and said, more people have to see this. How, however we can help, Eddie, let us know. So, so we jumped in to help, but it, the product has to be there. The performance has to be there. Taylor, who played Alicia, is an amazing yes, Taylor, uh, yeah. actor. Uh, so great. So we, I think, between Morgan and I, we we had a sense that this was something that would, you know, it stirred our hearts. So we thought it it, it could stir a lot more hearts. And is that how you literally pick projects, or is there like a formula? Is it kind of based on gut? How do you kind of pick projects to back? Uh, you you pick projects. They don't. You don't. I don't think you pick projects. I think they pick you. They pick you. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Yeah. Something comes along and smacks you in the face. I uh, know with its message and its goodness and its uh, craftsmanship. The if you're in the business, there's hardly anything else you can do but pass it on as best you can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, um, a, a little birdie tells me that um, it's your birthday coming soon, Morgan. Yes. And I don't know, a couple of weeks, maybe. That's right. That's right. Yeah. What have you got planned? 
Uh, I, I don't have any plans. I'm going to attend the party that is being planned. Okay. <laughs> You're going to show up <laughs> and show out, hopefully. Excellent. Yes. Any chance of an invite? Huh? Any chance of an invite? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I thought I thought I was. Okay. <laughs> You know, it's not every day you get to speak to Morgan Freeman and potentially get invited to a birthday party. But yeah, no, um, I, I appreciate that. There's so many other people that want to be at the party, but um, happy birthday in advance. And, Thank you so much. Thank and all the best with your producing as well, because obviously everyone knows you as the Academy Award winning actor, but you do voiceovers, you do producing, you do so many other things. So keep it up, sir. Doing my best doing my very best to keep it up. And Thank no you. signs of retiring anytime soon, I imagine. I don't think you retire. I think you get retired. <laughs> okay. Or at least that's my case. I'm not going to retire. The business will handle that. Yeah. Excellent. And I guess the, the same sentiment is shared between Laurie and Eddie here. You're going to be working into your 90s and 100s? I'm always saying it's going to be, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, on behalf of everyone here on the Screen Lately show, thank you very much for joining us. It's been an absolute privilege and a pleasure to be talking to you, not just about Princess of the Road, but about the film industry in general. So on behalf of my wife, Claire, and myself, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you both. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye. Some people that see me, they might think my life's dirt. But I always thought of my life like a fairy tale story. Don't you want a home? I ain't got a home. Skid Row? It's not a home. Not for a 12 year old girl. Hello, Alicia. It's good to meet you. You said her father was ill. He suffered a traumatic brain injury while serving in Iraq. He has episodes, bad ones. Social services want to take you away from him. But nobody's looking out for your dad. He doesn't deserve that. Alicia! Have you seen little girl? She was visiting her dad. Alicia! Now we're going out of the city. We're going far away get better. I like that dream. That's a good dream. We stick together. You and me. How does it feel to be forgotten? What do you want more than anything? I'm winning this with this. You know, he's dangerous. He cannot take care of her. Dead. Dead. Strong. Resilient. These are the parts that you're made of. I think that you are very special. You, my daughter, ain't nothing gonna change. The Bohemia Euphoria Film of the Week on Choice FM UK. Amplifying the voices and stories of underrepresented people through film.